Well, good afternoon, everyone. How about a hand for data stacks? What a nice lunch that was, right? Good, good. Well, this afternoon, uh, we'll change pace a little bit and have more of a philosophical uh, discussion about you know, embracing optimistic design in your persistence layer, which I called eventual consistency doesn't equal hopeful consistency. So who am I? Uh, my name is Christos Kalanzis. I work at Netflix. I manage the uh, cloud persistence engineering team, which is a fancy word for the Cassandra team. Um, my Twitter handles, Chris Callen. Uh, if you want to link in, uh, there's my address. And I think the slides are going to go online, so uh, you don't have to take, uh, take note of it right now. So let's get started with a recap of Cassandra's replication and consistency. So Cassandra, as we all know, is eventually consistent, which means the data will get there eventually. Uh, but eventually is not a day from now. It's, it's, it's not a minute from now. It's, it's not even a second from now. You, in most cases, it's going to happen in milliseconds. Um, also, um, Cassandra has tunable consistency. Uh, you can do all, which in a replication factor of three means all three nodes need to get the, re uh, the right. Or if you're reading, you have to read from all three nodes. That, that's not that great on latencies. Uh, Quorum, Quorum has kind of been accepted as the de facto, you know, standard. It's, you know, a good balance between availability and latencies. Personally, I think it's meh. Uh, what I really like is one. And, um, and you know, we're going to talk a lot, of, uh, a lot in the next half hour about why one is okay for your reads and your writes. So l let's take a trip back in time, back in the early 2000s. Uh, we had one master database. And, you know, we needed to scale reads out. So what did we do? We, we you know, we, we, slay, we had a bunch of slaves either piggybacking or replicating right off the master. Um, as you can see in the diagram, writes went to the master, updates uh, went to the slave, and the application would read from the slaves and write from the master. Well, that's an eventual con uh, eventually consistent architecture. Um, but, you know, sometimes transactions got lost in replication. And we were fine with it. Sometimes we didn't even know it. Um, there wasn't a repair function. So I tried that yesterday in the latest version of MySQL, and repair database didn't work. So it didn't, it didn't repair my cluster of masters and slaves. So we trusted it. And there's a lot of big name companies out there that still trust it. So. Um, when I talk to a lot of these companies and, and you know, they're thinking about going to Cassandra and you know, they've got a lot of concerns. And the concerns are usually the same. And here's the top three. I want high consistency in my reads and writes just like I have in my RDBMS you know, master slave cluster. Well, you, don't, you never really had it. So if you're concerned about it in Cassandra, you should really be concerned about it in, in, in your current architecture. I want my DB to catch integrity issues. Uh, th that's, that's a funny one, because um, if, if anyone's a data architect out here, we've been turning off foreign keys for years on our databases to, to reduce latencies and, and, and increase our write throughput. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, modern uh, MVC frameworks like Rails and Grails, when you use their inter internal um, object domain creation tools, they're not creating foreign keys, even if you're creating some kind of relation between the objects. And the final one, which, which is one of my favorite and we'll, and we'll you know, touch upon uh, for a little bit, is can I trust Cassandra, that Cassandra will replicate my data when writing at CL1? Well, I had that question asked about uh, a month ago, actually, with a Netflix. So one, one of the application designers said, you know, I write a quorum. And, and I read a quorum because do I really trust it? And in a replication factor of three, you know, if I write at one, will it actually go to, um, to, uh, to all three replicas? So I said, you know what, let me test it. So I created a multi-data center Cassandra cluster, just happened to be on 117, uh, 48 nodes in each data center. Uh, I put load on the cluster. Um, uh, this is wordy, I've got a diagram which summarizes this. Um, I put 100,000 total operations per second, 50,000 each, in each data center. And then I wrote a million records. I wrote a million records, 
as you can see on the bottom right. And then I read the same million records, all at consistency level one, the, uh, the write and the read, and they all came back, which means not only did they replicate within the data center, they actually successfully replicated outside uh, to the other data center, and I, I was randomly hitting, uh, hitting nodes, uh, so you know I wasn't always hitting uh, just one node. So you can trust it. And so, well, no test is, is good if you only run it once, so we ran it five times. And each time we had the same result. All records were read back successfully. So we can trust it. So now we know we can trust Cassandra. Now we know that you know, our current architectures aren't as, um, as high, uh, high consistency as, um, as we thought they were. So why is it we're trying to always use Quorum or all when, when designing um, a schema or an application using Cassandra? So this is where we're gonna get into optimistic versus pessimistic design. So in a pessimistic design, if you're gonna do Quorum writes, Quorum reads, and God forbid all, um, you're designing with high cons you're punishing your users 99.9% .9 of the time. And, I, and I'm being generous with that 99.9. .9. As you saw, 100% of the time it was fine, but for argument's sake, let's say 99.9% .9 of the time, it's gonna come back successfully. Uh, higher consistency, as we all know, uh, equals higher latency. So, uh, and, and higher latency means you've got a diminished user experience, especially in an architecture uh, that's, um, that's a service-oriented uh, architecture where uh, one web page may call five or six services and each one is making a database call underneath. So embrace optimistic design. Trust your data store. I just showed you that Cassandra can be trusted. Uh, know your business and your application. I mean, yes, okay, this is not the answer for every application, but think about it. Um, can, what, can your application live without uh, you know, high consistency level in your reads and writes? I'll give you an example. So Netflix, as you know, you can watch a movie, you can pause, go to another device, and you know, continue where you left off. And that's being done in the background by sending, by sending signals to a Cassandra database. And uh, we're actually writing at, at a, a consistency level of one. 99.99% .99 of the time, it's fine. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's, the movie's gonna start five minutes earlier because that may be the last, uh, the last ping we, we recorded into the database. Well, we know our business, so we don't believe, I mean, who, who in this uh, you know, audience is gonna dump their Netflix subscription because once in a million, you know, you, you resumed on another device and it was a couple of minutes earlier and not exactly where you left it. Well, I don't, th I don't think anyone. And, and if you do, maybe you should be our customer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, really, you need to know your application, you need to know uh, what problem you're actually solving, and, you know, and, and in certain cases, you're, you're gonna have to handle edge cases through contingency plans. And I've got a couple of examples of, of companies that aren't Netflix and how they handle contingency plans um, in, a, in, a, in, a, um, uh, in a eventual consistent uh, architecture. So the first example, Amazon. Sometimes you buy something on Amazon and it's just not, not there. It's not, it says it's in stock, but it was, it's not. You know, when they go fulfill the order, uh, you know, either the robots in the warehouse can't find it or, or, or if, if it's a warehouse with, with humans, the human can't find it. And so what do they do? They cancel the order. Um, they cancel the order and their contingency plan is they'll credit you 10% towards a future purchase. Okay. I mean, it kind of sucks. I wanted it, you know. We're in the generation that wants everything right away, but, you know, it happens, and, you know, they, uh, they uh, not reward us, but, you know, they have a nice contingency plan when that happens, so it, it doesn't hurt that much. So, okay, here's re that's an example of retail, being able to live in a, in a low, consistency, uh, low consistency architecture. 
But what about financial? I mean, surely that needs to be, you know, high, uh, highly consistent, right? I mean, you know, eventually consistent doesn't work in the financial world. Well, banks are the most eventually consistent system out there. Um, you know, I can, I can write a check. Actually, I'm gonna write you a check for a million dollars, okay? One of two things, please, yeah. One of two things are gonna happen. Either because of my very generous Netflix salary and the fact that our stock jumped uh, you know, really high in the past year and I cashed options, I'll be able to cover the check, or it'll bounce. It's gonna bounce, by the way. So, um, you know, the banks have contingency plans. Uh, they're gonna try and recoup, uh, recoup the funds uh, out of the uh, you know, target bank account and also charge <laughs> a very handsome fee for you bouncing a check. So, you know, the, the myths that, you know, everything needs to be highly consistent, uh, you know, aren't true. Uh, and, and I've just shown that even banks, you know, uh, the banking system is, 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 a, is a low consistent uh, um, design. Now, I'm giving you the tools, I'm, 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 giving, you, I'm giving you examples of, of, of where this works and, and, and where it doesn't. And um, the idea is, I, I want you guys to go back to your companies. I want you guys to um, really, really think deeply about the applications you're building and, and, and really evaluate you know, how consistent you need to make your application. So you're gonna go back to your company and you're gonna face hurdles, right? You're gonna be a little pawn against the whole chessboard of, of engineers and managers who, who probably think you, you drank something silly at the DataStax conference and uh, you, know, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, engineers are stubborn. You know? One plus one equals two, not eventually two. Uh, so you're gonna to have to manage down. Uh, middle management is scared. I mean, you, you know, good on you for those using Cassandra that you convinced them to even be using Cassandra. Uh, now, you know, you're going to have to convince them to, uh, to accept a low, uh, low, consistent, uh, low consistency architecture. That's not going to be easy. You're going to have to manage up as well. Uh, you're going to have to uh, engage the product team. A lot of engineers, they like, give me the specs, go away, I'll build it for you, and, you know, just hand a nice, you know, box uh, of, of software and code that did exactly what you asked. Well, now a conversation needs to happen. You need to go back to the product team and say, hey, look, I can do this, but hear what, hear, hear what the trade-offs are. Higher latency, uh, you know, diminished user experience. You know, let's talk. And, and you know, a lot of them will listen because if, if you tell them that the user experience is gonna suffer, the, you know, they're gonna be right there with you saying, okay, cool, let's, let's reduce the consistency and let's figure out what those edge cases are. So how to overcome those hurdles? Wow, we really breezed through this. So uh, how to overcome these hurdles? Uh, you can prove it through a POC. That'll help manage the downstream. That'll have, help manage uh, the engineers. Uh, Rupa and I, the DB engineer that ran that test, uh, we really, um, you know, we really changed one of those engineering managers' minds by, by showing him uh, the results of that test, and they accepted to reduce their, uh, their consistency level. Um, you need to show the benefits of improved user experience. I mean, if it's going to take five seconds to load a page, you know, t telling, telling a product guy, hey, I can cut that latency in half, well, you know, they're gonna be happy about that and say, okay, cool, let's do it. And finally, you may be working for the wrong company. Uh, Netflix is hiring, uh, <laughs> jobs.netflix.com. And, uh, and, you know, I'm looking for DevOps engineers. If, 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 you're, if you're such a person, come see me after the session and, and we'll, we'll have a chat. Uh, so we really blew through this, so I wanna open this up to questions. And, and, and who, uh, whoever I pick, please, please go to the microphone. Okay, let's start with you. So when you were talking about the benefits of uh, lowering your consistency level, 
In real numbers, how did that change latency? So, um, we were, we were um, like I said, the de facto has been quorum, right? So people have written mm -hmm. and, and read in quorum. So um, quorum, uh, as, as, for those who don't know, when you, when you read or write quorum, you're writing to two nodes, and, and you're, or you're reading from two nodes, and you're waiting for um, the coordinator to actually finish writing to those two nodes before it releases the write. Or uh, it's reading from two nodes, then, uh, then, really, um, uh, then really checking which one's got the latest timestamp and sending you back. So we cut it by two, th when you go to CL1, you cut your latencies by like two thirds at that wow. point. Yeah. Okay. It's not even half, it's two thirds because it, it, you're just doing a point read uh, back and forth as opposed to doing the extra comparisons and, and waiting for those writes to happen. And I guess writes would be what more, I'm more concerned about because uh, reads, I'm fine with consistency level one, but with a write, if you're sure it's written immediately, then you know it's a little safer, right? But yeah, yeah. So, so did you see similar numbers you, you gotta, for writes you, as well? Or? Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay. Because like I said, you're writing to two nodes, you're waiting for both nodes to, uh, to have gotten the write, you're waiting for it uh, to uh, the coordinator to agree that they got it, and then mm -hmm. come back. Okay. Yeah. James. Hey, Christos. So during your million uh, record comparison test, how long did you wait after um, feeding the data into Cassandra before doing your million record comparison? Great question, great question. So we were, we were writing, and then, and then we were reading, so I think we were off by uh, half a second, so 500 milliseconds. And um, is there like a standard tool, like the Percona toolkit for comparing two Cassandra databases or clusters? Um, I think there's new features in, in 1.2 that can catch possible dropped, uh, dropped replication or statistics on that. However, there's a repair, uh, if you just want to blindly, you know, heal the whole cluster if you think you've had dropped operations, there's a repair command in Cassandra which will then make sure everyone's got all the data they need to. Thanks. Thank you. Howdy. Hi. Um, did you do any testing where nodes failed in the midst of your testing? Yes, absolutely. So, um, and, and that ties into that repair command as well. So uh, we, did, we did kill some nodes while we were, we were doing that test. And uh, I think that was in our third or fourth run that, that we killed some nodes. And we still continued reading from it. However, um, after an event like that, we will run a repair at that point, um, just to be sure. Did you, um, so, so in that case, when you say you killed a node, did the node become um, unavailable permanently, i.e. was the data on that node lost? Or? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. We didn't just shut the node off, we terminated the node completely. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Cool. Any other questions? Cool. Ah, yes. So the question is have we seen use cases where CL1 is not appropriate? Uh, there's always going to be use cases uh, where, where it's not appropriate. I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm not here to preach CL1 only. Uh, there are. There are. Yeah. I, I can't. I can't lift the kimono completely. <laughs> sure. Yes, so uh, for your experiments, the... Uh, when Hold on. Just, yeah. sorry, sorry to cut you off. However, we have no use cases where all are appropriate. Quorum's the highest we're going to go. So we create tables we can define like consistency level C or uh, quorum. But your query, you can have a different consistency. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. But for your experiments, how do you do that? You have the all uh, the uh, consistency is one when you create table and also you query it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We, we wrote at consistency level one and we read at consistency level one. So the replication factor is one? No, it's three. Oh, it's three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so the replication factor of the cluster was three. We wrote. It got replicated successfully uh, local, uh, uh, locally and at the other data center. And the reads happened at the other data center. And we were randomly hitting nodes. So it's not like we, were, you, we chose the node that should have that token. We just, you know, we just let the coordinator do its thing and randomly chose nodes. And we read everything back. Yes, uh, we run some clusters, uh, Cassandra clusters. And uh, I noticed that there's always a problem when you do repair. It takes a very long time to repair that cluster. We have the 16 yes. Cassandra nodes. Mm -hmm. So would that be a case that 
we, we need to consider when we run our Cassandra clusters. For example, for the repair situations. So, so is the question... It the, takes a very long time to repair. Yeah, yeah. well, the, repair... Is that an issue? Or? So repair, repair is a safety net, right? So, uh, and, and, and the reality is we do run repair regularly on our clusters. Yeah. Um, so the worst case scenario actually, if, if a node didn't get it, it will get the data next time we run repair. That's the worst case scenario. Yeah. But that's in the point zero zero one, you know, off that, that you know, a, a particular write didn't make it in. So um, repairs take a long time, yes, absolutely. Repairs do take a long time, but uh, you know, it's, it's that safety net. It's that absolute, okay, you know, we're drawing a line from now on, it's, it, it's repaired and everything's everywhere. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Yes. So you were using Priam um, in this test? Yeah. So you were going uh, token aware right to where one of the replicas was? You're, I think, I think you're, you're, you're thinking, am I using SDNX at the client level? Not That's, Priam. Yes. Okay, yeah. 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 So no, we were doing round robin. Purposely. Round robin. So Purposely. You're, so your uh, coordinator wasn't necessarily something that had the replica exactly. of the data. Exactly. So that was very that was a very important in our test to prove to prove that uh, that uh, you know Cassandra's actually doing the right thing underneath. So if we've run uh, benchmarks and we've gotten numbers back, and we drop from quorum to one, we should expect it. If we had a replication factor of three, we should expect our Cassandra turnaround to be a third the latency. It, it should be significantly faster. My particular use case. Uh, was two, uh, two, uh, two thirds faster simply because that was the application. Kay. I don't know what your read write pattern is, but it should be significantly faster. Thanks. Thank you. Cool. Yes. So, for that particular case, uh, basically, when we compare quorum uh, versus consistency level one, mm -hmm. um, does Cassandra execute? Um, if you use Quorum, for example, and replication factor is three, uh, so you basically need to get response from two. Um, in no, Quorum. In Quorum, yeah. yes. So does Cassandra send those requests in parallel? So basically yeah, it, it means yeah. you're limited by slowest uh, node out of two, right? It's not, basically you're not going to get benefit like 50% faster because you're, you send requests in parallel and basically maybe one node is 10% slower. That's basically your benefit, not 50%. All right? things being equal, <laughs> it, sh it, should be, it, it should be around 50% faster, assuming, assuming all nodes are, are the same, for your so, right. So let's see. And uh, you are blasting all nodes. So, so what the coordinator is doing, it's waiting for the two first to come back, and then, and then, it's, uh, and then it's returning. So does it, send, does it send requests to, like, par in parallel to all nodes? Yeah. yeah. Assuming that all nodes like uh, like equally like loaded, you expect response like approximately in the same time. I mean, I mean, you don't send first request, wait, wait for response, and send second no, request. No, no, no. It's it's, blast, that's, that's, it's blasting everyone and yes, waiting for response. Yes, that's why. Out. Why do you expect like 50% uh, faster if you use uh, consistency level one versus quorum? Good, good question. That's what we saw. And oh, actually, hold on, Nitish over there, one of my DB engineers, can answer that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, just to follow up on the testing where you um, uh, simulated failures during the testing, mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that there's a case where if you're writing to a replica node um, using a replica as your coordinator, um, which even in round robin you would have encountered mm -hmm. a, a few times, um, the write is accepted on the coordinator with a consistency level of one, 
um, oh, but then the doing. node immediately fails. Yeah. Um, repair is unable to repair that right because you've lost it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, did you encounter that in practice? Uh, so like I said, we ran it five times. So five, I'm sure if I ran this test infinitely and, and, and did an infinite amount of permutations, I would have seen uh, some, uh, uh, some failures. Um, but that's why I said 99.9%. .9%. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. So I like this idea of uh, having the applications compensate essentially for inconsistency. But I'm curious uh, what you would recommend in terms of strategies, both from an operational perspective and when you're talking to application developers about detecting and reasoning about these inconsistencies. For instance, do people say, well, as long as I have an SLA of 99.9%, uh, that's good enough? Or do they need to, or, or do they often ask for maybe like, well, I mean, one aspect of optimism is a, is a callback or a yeah. notification when, when things go wrong. Yeah. I'm curious if that's a requirement or even whether or not um, pe people, you know, want that sort of. Because it's kind of annoying Absolutely. to give you the answer and say it was the wrong answer. Right? Absolutely. So I'm going to give you the cop-out answer. It depends on your application. But I'll give you an example. So, um, you know, in, in certain things, we might not catch it in the application. We'll catch it by customer service calls. And, and you know, at that point, it's, it's a human contingency plan. It's not necessarily code that, that's doing it. There's, there's, there's going to be, you know, a combination of both depending on your application. And when you do it in code, how do you typically, are, are there mechanisms with Cassandra well, that you yes. leverage? Yes, so, so uh, Cassandra does have mechanisms actually to, to fix it. Uh, there's read repair. Sure. So you can turn on read repair. So if, it, if, sure. if you return it once and then read repair runs, and, and depending on what percentage of read repair you have on, the second time you read it, it will actually be repaired. Sure. Thanks. You're welcome. Here we're talking about the uh, consistency level of Cassandra, but we always face a case where we have uh, different systems. For example, we want to have a search over the data, so we have some index we create built on top of data. Mm -hmm. So how do you guarantee the consistencies between these different systems? Because that's the problem I'm facing for our gotcha. group. Gotcha. And uh, I think Netflix provides the same like search infrastructure on yeah. top of Cassandra. Yeah. Well, uh, in the Netflix one, um, the data we index and we search, you know, like when you put the movie and it pops down, it, it doesn't change as often as uh, in other applications. I so see. we can control that. Uh, we can control that, uh, you know, either through QA, constant QA, and, and so on. But that, that's a very, you know, we can have a discussion offline and, and talk about how do you, cons you know, if, if, if you go DSC and you've got solar and you've got your Cassandra yes. and all of a sudden yes. it's not consistent between both, yeah. we, can, we, we can have a chat later and okay. uh, I'll, okay. I'll share some ideas. It might not be the absolute solutions. Okay. Thanks. Cool. I think that's our time. Thank you, everyone.